Thank you very much, Miles, uh, for the flattering introduction. Just as a reminder, this is a technical deep dive and which spans two sessions. So my talk, which is roughly an hour long, will be spanning two sessions. There'll be a 10 break in the middle. Nonetheless, uh, I'll cut off at some point and continue in the next session. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, all the, any uh, follow-up questions would be at the end of the second session. So without further Let's start off. So uh, you, you heard in the morning during the keynote, Mate and Ali and everyone talk about structure streaming and the, how it interacts with Delta and stuff. In this talk, I'm going to give a kind of a, a overview of what structure streaming is all about and a little, go a little bit deep into some of the most important aspects of structure streaming and, uh, <coughs> and, uh, and end with how we use structure streaming in Databricks itself, especially how our customers use it. A little bit overview of that as well. Let's start off. So, uh, Miles already gave an introduction of uh, myself. So, I've been involved with Spark since its beginning. I, I was part of the AMP Lab where Spark started. Mati and I started uh, working on Spark streaming together. Currently, I'm a software engineer at Databricks. And <coughs> To start with, uh, Mati already talked about this, that building stream processing systems in a robust way is hard. The problem, to give a brief overview of what Mati talked about, is that the problem lies in the complexities of uh, stuff associated around stream processing. For example, you have to deal with complex data. You have diverse data formats. It can be JSON, Avro, bin custom binary formats. Your data may be coming from many different sources in, in widely varying formats. Data can be dirty. You may have corrupted data. You may have late out of order data. Then the workloads you want to run on the data can be pretty complex. You have event time processing. You want to do uh, aggregations on event time. Uh, you want to do machine learning on the data. You want to do interactive querying of the data that has arrived. Uh, then, obviously, you have to interact with a lot of complex different systems. Uh, things like various different storage systems, like um, uh, file systems, S3, databases, both SQL, NoSQL, uh, stream streaming systems like Kafka, Kinesis, etc. So, a variety of different storage systems you have to interact with and reason about their, uh, their semantics, and obviously, each of these systems can be distributed and therefore complex by themselves. You have to deal with system failures and stuff. So, and, and you still yet want to reason about what are the fault tolerance guarantees that you're getting despite all these complexities. So the whole point of structure streaming was to make stream processing uh, on, Spark, the, on Spark SQL engine really smooth and fast. So it's, uh, you don't have to think about uh, dealing with scalability, fault tolerance. It's just fast out of the box. You have a rich, unified, high-level API to deal with uh, complex data and complex workloads. And you have a rich ecosystem of uh, data sources and data sinks that are continuously growing so that you can deal with complex storage systems without, and the system, the engine, Spark itself, takes care of some of the lower-level complexities and you don't have to reason about each and every different systems individually. And the key idea that, that forced us uh, to go back to the drawing board uh, is uh, after learning stuff by working with customers through using D streams for last uh, two three years, we realized that it's that you as a as a user of Spark streaming should not have a reason about streaming. Basically, Spark itself should handle all the uh, complexities and corner cases. So you should be writing simple SQL-like queries, and Spark should actually take care of handling all the complexities uh, and just seamlessly update the answer uh, and always give you the correct answer, despite all the complexities. So uh, to do this, we build structure streaming. And uh, to, give a, to, to start with an overview, let's look at what a simple structure streaming query looks like. And the usual canonical example is a streaming word count. So let's see what a streaming word count query looks like. So first step, let's say you're trying to read from Kafka and you want to uh, take all the records and do a word count on the records, which, uh, ha which happen to be strings. So first step is you have to read from Kafka. And these are the few lines. I'll go into each of these details in, in much more detail in the rest of my talk. But this is a high level overview. So first step, you want to define the source of your stream. You can specify one source, multiple sources, union them together. You can, uh, there are a lot number of built-in sources like files, Kafka, sockets. Uh, <coughs> and 
so and you can and you, you have to just specify the format and where to read from. Second step is actually now that you've created a data frame out of this uh, from the source, you can apply your usual data frame operations like group by mapping, reducing aggregations, etc. So in this case, what we're doing is uh, converting uh, the whole uh, the records into string uh, and treating them as keys, and then counting the number of uh, each values of each key. And what underneath the system does is basically as you're writing this uh, query, the system underneath accidentally generates an lo internal logical plan that kind of at a high level expresses what is the computation you want to do. Then Spark takes that logical plan and converts it to a very optimized physical plan. And, and here, all the optimizations that were built into Spark SQL over the last three, four years actually come into play. And what it finally generates is a series of actual physical execution plans, which keeps executing new data as it derives from Kafka. So Spark SQL actually uh, takes your this very simple SQL-like, batch-like query and converts it into a series of uh, incremental execution plans while taking care of all the complexities of late data and stuff. You don't have to worry about any of that. So, well, the, the code is not completely done because you have to specify what to do with the final output uh, word counts. In this case, uh, we have to specify a sync. Let's say you want to output it back to Kafka in, in a different topic, so you specify that. And then now comes the details of how you exactly want it to be executed. For example, let's say I want to do it in batches of one minute. So you specify that trigger interval, and you want to specify that don't, uh, that output only the updated word counts every time. Every time there's new data, only output the updated word counts. And so you can specify these different output modes, whether you want to update only the things that have updated, or you want to uh, uh, r r write out to Kafka only the new things, or all the records every time. So you can specify that. And then finally, to for fault tolerance purposes, you have to specify a checkpoint location where the Spark SQL engine would write the necessary data so that it can recover seamlessly from any kind of failures. And, so, and with that, I'll again go into detail on how exactly this works. Uh, you finally call start. And, 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 and what the system does underneath is that all the, the series of inc incremental execution plans that it generates, it keeps track of the exact set of Kafka offices that it uh, each uh, my each batch processes and uh, uh, tracks it by writing them out into a write ahead log. Uh, whenever there is any failure, you can recover from uh, th that checkpointed offsets seamlessly, and it, it in total gives end to end exactly one's guarantee, both for both stateless as well as stateful stream processing. And for those who have actually uh, used the previous version of this, Spark Streaming D streams, all uh, there are big advantages of the checkpointing that we have introduced in structured streaming because in DStreams, uh, the lessons we have learned from some of the DStreams pain point is uh, dealing with checkpoints and recovering from checkpoints in, uh, in a seamless manner. We have learned from those uh, mistakes and we have designed checkpoints in such a way that it is always going to be forward compatible because internally we save the offsets in JSON rather than binary formats that were not compatible at, uh, in in the past, and so you can always uh, recover from uh, previous checkpoints, even if you change your query a little bit, you add filters and stuff. So we have designed this in a much better way than the earlier DStreams for those who have actually worked with DStreams and, 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 and faced those pain points. And regarding performance, uh, Mati already talked about this, that we have uh, shown that we, because of all the SQL and tungsten engine optimizations we have uh, worked on and continue to work on over the last three, four years, we, get, we can get more than 4x higher throughput than, uh, in the, than Apache Flink in a very standardized Yahoo benchmark. And 4x uh, faster performance means 4x lower cost, 4x the ch lower the chances of failures in one of the nodes, in, sp in spot prices, failures, etc. So again, we have published a blog post on this. I highly recommend you to take a look at our uh, blog uh, to see how exactly we uh, did this benchmark. And you can also rep reproduce that benchmark yourself uh, by running our published notebooks on our platform. So this was a high-level overview. Let's start digging a little bit deeper, layer by layer. 
So one of the most compelling use cases that motivated us to actually build this structure streaming, design it in this way, is, uh, is, what, is a complex streaming ETL pipeline, which pretty much like 60-70% of the streaming workloads that we have seen in our customers and in the, in the wide uh, open source uh, community is basically doing ETL and trying to do ETL in the right way. And the way it has traditionally been done is that you have streams of data coming in. Well, what people do is that immediately, with, as soon as possible, dump the raw streaming data as files uh, as soon as possible, within seconds, and then do a periodic job like every six hours or every 12 hours, sometimes in the best case every one hour, uh, where you take the raw file uh, data and convert it into more structured form like tables so that it can be consumed by uh, downstream by more structured workloads like SQL, uh, that data analytics uh, tools, etc. So now the problem with this approach is that for the data to be usable, it takes hours for the data to be actually usable, which is okay for some workloads, but for a very large variety of workloads, it's not okay. For example, if you're doing some sort of um, fraud detection and stuff, if it's hours before you can detect or do any analysis on the data, then the, the, the cause is already lost. So it is often unacceptable uh, when time is really of essence to wait for hours before that you can start processing the data. So one of our main motivating use case was to bypass all th this two-step process and make the raw data available as structured tables structure in, in, in a structured format within seconds. And, and let's see how you can do that using structure stream. So let's start with a more concrete example. Suppose you have JSON data coming in from Kafka. You have, uh, what you want to do is you want to parse the JSON, flatten it, because it may be very nested JSON and stuff. So flatten the individual fields inside the JSON and store it in a structured parquet table so that you can query it much more easily. And obviously you want to get end to end exactly one's guarantee. All the code you need to write is this. This is pretty much the entirety of the streaming queries that you need to write, minus all the imports and stuff. Uh, let's walk through this code step by step. You can see three parts. Let me walk through them. First step, I, this, is, this is digging deep into how you actually read from Kafka. So you have to specify the Kafka format and exactly how and where to read from. For example, you have to specify the Kafka brokers. These are all options in the uh, in the in the in the, uh, <coughs> in the code, uh, so you have to specify Kafka dot Bootstrap dot servers where and specify the the, uh, the comma separated list of brokers. You can specify whether to subscribe to a single topic, subscribe to a pattern of topics, or subs or or specifically assign a particular topic and partition. So you can see that these things are very uh, similar to the subscribe subscribe pattern and and can assign of um, the Kafka client APIs. So we kind of match that. And you have to specify where do you want to start reading from. Do you want to start reading from the latest offset or the earliest available offset in Kafka or something specific, et cetera. And what you get out of this, this raw, da this raw data object is essentially a data frame, which, and for those who are uh, not familiar with data frame, data frame is uh, Spark SQL's basic API, which essentially stands for a collection of uh, row objects defined by a common schema. And by schema, I mean essentially this, this, this essentially looks like a table, which has specific columns with well-defined uh, uh, column types. And in this case, the, the data frame that, has, that is generated through the Kafka source is essentially has the key and the value as uh, binary columns, also, and the topic partition that each of those key value came from as additional columns as well as the timestamp on when the, the Kafka provides on when Kafka received the timestamp. Now that you have this data frame with all these columns, uh, all this information as data frame columns, you can now start doing arbitrary data frame operations. For example, uh, in my case, I want to first of all take the binary uh, key value data from Kafka and convert it into a string so that I can parse it as a JSON. So first step is casting it as a string. Second step is actually parsing it as uh, parsing it as JSON. So for that, we have this inbuilt function in uh, Spark SQL called from JSON, where you specify the column you want to parse as a 
JSON string as well and uh, the schema that you expect and what comes out is essentially a nested column of containing all the uh, fields inside the JSON as nested columns. So we're converting essentially a string column into a nested column using this function from JSON. And then finally you want to actually flatten this out because uh, uh, downstream querying flattened columns might be easier both from efficiency as well as from the user uh, uh, readability point of view. So you want to flatten it out and that's also pretty easy. You just say d select data dot star and which flattens out the, the nested columns. Then the final step, uh, before I reach the final step, I want to say that, I want to highlight the fact that uh, not just from JSON, there are, uh, there are a huge number of built-in APIs inside Spark SQL that allow you to do really very complex transformations really out of the box in the, in the most efficient manner because we have uh, gone ahead and actually built these functions underneath and took, taken the pains to actually uh, make them super, super efficient to the point of using uh, full whole stage code gen, low level uh, bit pattern matching, all sorts of crazy stuff that is uh, done, usually have been traditionally done in uh, true databases. We have, all, we have done similar stuff inside our Spark SQL engine, our Tungsten engine. Uh, and so you, don't, you have a huge plethora of complex functions built in that you can leverage and get the best uh, performance out of Spark SQL. So the final step is obviously writing it out to Parquet. So now in this case, I know that later I want to actually query probably the last one day of data or last 12 hours of data if something goes wrong. I want to uh, start quick, quickly start querying it. So I, besides saving it as Parquet, I also want to partition the data by date or by, uh, by time. So in this case, I'll partition, I'm specifying that partition by date. Um, and then specify the checkpoint location and then finally call start. Now, when you actually call start, that actually starts the processing. Well, till now, as, as, as these lines were executed, it was only setting up the query. It was not actually doing any processing. Start actually forces the system to actually um, start processing the data in the background on the cluster. So, and what it does underneath is that it goes through the whole logical plan, optimized uh, plan, uh, the physical planning through the, using the Spark planner, and start generating this, sequ this uh, continuous sequence of incremental plans that keeps processing new data from Kafka. And what it returns is this handle to that streaming query that is being executed. And you can use this handle to um, manage that streaming query. For example, get statistics out of it, uh, how do you, to, to monitor it, to stop it, start it, restart it, etc. And so what this does is that it's essentially reading directly from Kafka and immediately making the data available in the Parquet format within seconds. So uh, you can start running complex ad hoc queries on the latest uh, data within seconds because it's already in the structured format. And this, and this is a, a, a game changer because um, the way we do this uh, is, and we have, we have written a blog post about this to go into more details, is that uh, both for Parquet as well as, uh, and which, which, as well as for Databricks Delta, which uh, and Databricks Delta was like a, is, is a, uh, was inspired by our earlier work on Parquet. The way we do it ensures that either if there is any kind of failure, either all the data in the in a particular batch in, is is visible in the Parquet table or none of it. You can reason about the atomicity of what is available in the Parquet table. So uh, both in the open source version we have. The, the original version of it working on Parquet or any file format. Uh, this actually formed the inspiration what led to Databricks Delta that Michael and Ali was talking about today. So we have added more Kafka support over time as well. You can write out to Kafka as you saw it in, in, an ex in my, my earlier example. Uh, you can uh, interactively directly query Kafka not as a stream, but actually as an interactive or a batch query. So you can essentially treat Kafka like a pure uh, file system, like storage system. And you can say that, OK, I want to query from uh, this offset to that offset directly from Kafka without having to even write to, uh, to a storage system, like file system and stuff. So that, and that is often very powerful because you may want to actually uh, go back to the raw data inside Kafka to do 
uh, a different kind of analysis. For example, maybe some of the data was corrupted, which got filtered out in the process of writing out to the Parquet file. You may want to actually go back and directly uh, get the data out of Kafka and try to understand that um, why was it corrupted and try to recover the data and stuff. So this makes it much easier to do that. And this is something that uh, I don't, I very few other systems allow you to do. We also have support for Amazon Kinesis as part of our Databricks runtime, and it's pretty similar to Kafka. You specify how you want to read it uh, using, you have to specify your AWS access key, secret key, IAM roles, etc. cetera. Uh, you can specify where to read from, uh, latest or earliest, uh, what is the stream name to read from, etc. Pretty much same as Kafka. Okay, so this was a high level overview of something that is still reasonably simple, uh, at least conceptually, something that is only map only because you're not doing any sort of aggregation. You're just trying to take the data, clean it up, structure, uh, put it in, into a well-known structure and, and write it out. The next step usually is um, working when you want to actually process the data while being aware that you want to do analytics based on the time in the data, working with event time essentially. And so this is one of the biggest challenges that the earlier Spark streaming, the, the DStream APIs did not address well uh, because it, it, the APIs were not designed to expose event time data in the right way. Um, <coughs> uh, and so this is something we learned from our past mistake and we designed the APIs in such streaming in the right way so that event time, uh, processing using event time becomes very natural. So, uh, some of the challenges that we had to consider, uh, and anyone who wants to process using event time has to consider is data can be late, out of order, and, and how do you reason about when, to, how late of data to consider, when do you, uh, what happens when there is late data, do you update the aggregate or not, how, what is the right way to update it, reasoning about it, etc. So, let's see how we do event time aggregations in structured streaming. So the way we have formulated the APIs is, is that windowing is, no, is basically just another type of grouping. So if you think about it, windowing is essentially taking every record and based on the timestamp inside the record, put it in a right window bucket. It, now your windows, if they are non-overlapping windows, then every record will essentially go into a single a window bucket or a window group. If there are overlapping windows, then every record will go into multiple buckets. So, uh, so the, and, and thinking it in this way makes it very easy to follow the API because all we are saying is now instead of grouping by a particular specific key, we are grouping by instead a, a window on a key. And so here we are specifying group by window on the timestamp using one hour windows. So in this case, I'm specifying one hour non-overlapping windows. You can also specify overlapping windows like window, timestamp, one hour every 30, 30 minutes. So all that variation is possible. And then you can also combine with um, things like um, with other grouping keys. For example, you want to get the average signal strength of every device, every IoT device, uh, then you can go over, over 10 minute periods and you specify both the device as well as the window as grouping keys. And we have support for average right built in right out of the box. So uh, this becomes pretty easy. And you can write your own custom aggregations because we have all, since a uh, long time supported user defined aggregate functions and in batch and those just seamlessly work in streaming as well. What happens underneath though is that so we have these running aggregations going on for every window. And so to keep these aggregations, uh, these partial aggregates alive across these uh, micro batches, each of these incremental executions, we keep them around as distributed state. And what in every trigger, every, every incremental execution, it reads in the previous state, <coughs> updates it, and writes it out a new version of the state for the next trigger to consume. Now, this state is stored in the executor's memory as um, uh, <coughs> in the executor's memory, but it is also backed uh, to a fault tolerant file system like HDFS or S3 by saving all the changes to that in-memory state and into a into write-ahead log. So this is all inside the checkpoint location that you have specified. And, th and this happens completely seamlessly 
completely behind the scenes and you don't need to worry about that. All you need to specify is that checkpoint location and you're done. And so this ensures that uh, even stateful processing is exactly fault tolerant and gives exactly one's guarantee uh, without you having to actually reason about what happens under, in the case of a failure. Now this also handles late data pretty automatically. So uh, now if you think of this in terms of window buckets, we, have, we can have a bunch of buckets open at the same time all uh, for, for every hour's count. So for example, um, in this case, in this figure shows that there are multiple one hour windows open and if there is any late data, uh, you can see that if, if there is any late data that counts of, the no, of older windows can get incremented because we carry around those older windows as part of the state. And so this seamlessly handles that whenever there is late data, it does get taken care of and counted properly. But now the problem is that we don't exactly know how long to keep each window open so that it can, it can keep receiving updates. So uh, to limit the size of the state, because if you keep all the windows around the, the, the size of the state will keep growing indefinitely. So to, to limit uh, uh, the size of the state, what we have added is something called watermarking. And, and a watermark is essentially a moving threshold of how late data is allowed to be. So the way it is calculated is that uh, you, uh, the system takes, keeps track of the max event time that the data, the, the engine has seen in the data. And this watermark is essentially a trailing threshold that trails behind this max event time. So that means that, for example, if the max event time seen by the system is 12.30 PM, then uh, uh, and the, we tell this, uh, the query that the watermark is defined as 10 minutes behind the max event time, then the watermark in this case at this point of time would be 12.20. And this trailing gap is what we call the watermark delay. And, and the semantics is that any data that is late but still not, uh, less than 10 minutes late will be within the, will be newer than the watermark and will be allowed to aggregate. We are going to keep those windows corresponding to that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that of times uh, uh, newer than the watermark, keep those windows open so the data will be allowed to aggregate. But windows that are older than the watermark will be cleared off and any too late data that derives will be ignored. So in this way, what you can do is that you can specify uh, in the query uh, how late data you want to consider. And then specifying this watermark is pretty easy. It's ju just this one thing that with watermark, what is the column by which I can calculate the event time? And what is the delay the engine is, should keep track of? And, uh, and so with this, you can specify exactly how, how much state you're willing to keep to handle how much late data. If you want to uh, handle more late data, then you, you will have to keep more state in the cluster, therefore have a, maybe a larger cluster or a cluster with a more memory. Uh, whereas if you, if you don't care about late data too much because if it's too late, then it's meaningless anyways, uh, there's no point using that, then you can keep the delay very short and you'll re be requiring much less state. So now this is, uh, this watermark is actually useful only in stateful operations. So if you specify this and, but later do not do any kind of stateful operations, uh, this watermark will just be ignored. Uh, and also if you, uh, if you write this, if you run this query on not a streaming data frame, but a batch data frame, uh, then this whole, this whole watermark is also completely ignored because in batch, all this doesn't matter. There is no late, late data by, by definition. So, and w so when you do this watermark, the system underneath what it will do is actually, if they, as, as data comes in, it will keep track of what is the max event time in the system. So the y-axis is the event time, and this is the processing time, or the wall clock time as the streaming query is, is running. So as data comes in uh, with uh, varying degree of event time, the system keeps track of the max event time, uh, and accordingly calculates what the watermark should be. And now if, there is any new any data that comes out of order late but still higher than the watermark the, it, those events will be considered 
and the counts would be updated. But any data that is later than the, or older than the watermark will be ignored. So I've, uh, so this is explained in more elaborate detail in uh, my blog post. Take a look at that. Uh, so uh, we are very close to uh, the end of this session. Let's actually, th this is a good point where we can uh, cut the session. I'll, uh, I'll start off exactly where we left off, uh, right here in 10 minutes. Th thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, there will be time at the end of the next session uh, uh, for questions, so please hold off all your questions and do remember them, because I would love to hear your questions. Thank you very much. See you in 10 minutes.